Good morning, everyone. Sorry about the slight delay starting there. Um, as usual, we've had some gremlins in the works. Fortunately, the robots haven't taken over. Um, we've got some really interesting talks uh, with you this morning, um, as you saw from the, uh, the background there. Okay, fantastic. Um, so, um, with no further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Matt Hale. Um, we've decided to be a little bit ambitious and start with a uh, live streaming event. Uh, so, what else could go wrong? Um, Matt Hale uh, has, has worked here for a number of years as well uh, in the fascinating area of evolutionary robotics. Um, and these are the little guys that hopefully won't be taking over the world. Uh, so, Matt, with no further ado, um, I'll pass over to you. Hi there, great, thanks. Yes, I'm Matt Hale, and I want to talk to you today, give you a bit of an introduction and a demonstration of this machine, which we call the, the robot fabricator. So the, the overall idea of this machine, as the name suggests, is to build new robots autonomously, so without any human having to, to build the robots. Instead, they can be built automatically by this machine. So. Before I give you the demonstration, I need to tell you a bit about why we're doing this. And that starts with thinking about the concept of evolution as, a, as an idea. So if you think about the, the abstract idea of evolution, what happens is there are uh, uh, lots of different individuals that, that make up a population, and the fitness of different individuals is, is measured in some way. So in natural evolution, that's which individuals are able to live long enough to reproduce and pass their genes on. And so the fitter individuals pass their genes to the next generation with some random changes, random mutations. So the next generation is hopefully a little bit fitter than the previous one. And then that happens again. The fittest pass their genes on to the next generation and again and again. And over time, the, the overall population gets better and better. So we can take this abstract idea and use it for what we call artificial evolution. And in this case, we're applying that idea to robots in evolutionary robotics. So what we do is we start with uh, some, some random designs for robots, and we measure each of them at, at some task and assign them a fitness. And so the, the fittest individuals, we take those and we make some random changes, some mutations, and create another generation and do that over and over again in the same way natural evolution does. And over time, the overall population should get better and better at whatever task it is we're trying to do. So 
So what this, this gives us, artificial evolution, it gives us a way of automatically designing robots. So instead of a human designing them, we have this process that designs them aut autonomously. And then in our project, which is called Autonomous Robot Evolution, we're trying to take that one step further. So as well as the design happening autonomously by this artificial evolution algorithm, we can also then construct the robots in the physical world autonomously. So instead of just being simulated, these robots, we can go from uh, through an automated design process and then an automated construction process and build these robots in the real world without a human having to do any of the, the, those key steps. So if you imagine that the evolutionary algorithm has just created a new design of robots, the robot fabricator has a couple of different types of components that it uses, then put these robots together. So the first kind of component I want to talk about is what we call the skeleton of the robot. So you can see that this is a, this is a 3D printed part. And because they're 3D printed, it means that different uh, robots can have quite different sizes and shapes of skeleton. So that gives, it, gives the robot its overall, its overall size and shape, as I say. So that, that gives a really big, uh, diverse uh, array of different possible robots that the RoboFab can make. But what we have here is just a lump of plastic. It's not yet a robot. So in order to, to add on um, things that we can't 3D print but a robot needs, so like actuators and sensors, we have these components here that we call, we call these the organs of the robot. This is the skeleton. These are the organs. So for example, this is a wheel organ. And you can't 3D print motors yet. So, so we have these pre-made in little packages. And then there are different points on the skeleton where the wheels or other organs can get attached. And so what this gives is evolution can choose the overall size and shape of the robot by changing the skeleton. And then it can decide how many wheels it wants and where to place them in different places. So I'll give you a, a live demo now, since the, everything's going to go, go perfectly, I'm sure. The, um, the first thing that, that happens, as I said, is the, the robot, uh, the RoboFab, sorry, produces the, the skeleton on the 3D printer over on this side. So um, I won't 3D print one live now because the 3D printing takes a few hours. So you need to use some imagination. Imagine that's just been 3D printed. And then we have this. This is a sort of a special case of the organs. We call this the head. So this includes the battery for the robot to provide power and also a, a Raspberry Pi to be the, the brain of the robot. And this goes into the middle of the skeleton here. And that forms kind of the, the core of the, of the robot. And if I place that on here, now we get into the, the proper bit of the demo. So the, the RoboFab will now assemble all the other organs onto the, onto the robot. So in the middle of the RoboFab here, you can see is this robot arm, which really forms the, the core of the, the RoboFab. And that will move over, and it will now pick up the first organ that Evolution has selected to go on this robot, which I think will be a sensor. So it will pick up the organ and then bring it over to where the robot's being assembled. And attach it on at the point on the robot that Evolution has chosen. Then as well as being mechanically attached on, we need to electrically connect that sensor to the brain because that's where the battery is and it needs to send its signals back. So the, the RoboFab pulls out the cable and then connects that into the head. And then if you watch the robot here now in a second, you'll see that it rotates round. So the, the assembly fixture here will rotate the robot. So this is just a kind of a practical thing. So it really helps the robot arm if we can uh, rotate the, the robot being constructed and then it doesn't have to reach over into a difficult position. It can always, uh, it can always reach the point where it needs to attach the. the... So next comes a, is a wheel, and again it will attach it to the point that evolution decides it needs to go on the robot. And then connect the cable again. Great. 
And just while it puts on the, the third and final organ, I'll talk a little bit about where we are in the project and, and what we, we're hoping to do next. So what we're demonstrating here is that the RoboFab can, can put together a new robot physically, the physical aspects of the robot that's been designed by evolution. And then the, the idea next is that what we need to do is be able to install a new brain into this robot. So we can download the controller from the simulation into the physical robot. And once we can do that, then we can start having these robots move around in the physical world, trying to perform the task that we, we've set for them. So for example, they might need to go to a particular place or we're, we're working on getting them to solve a maze so they can avoid different obstacles. Um, and then if we can do that in the physical world, instead of this process being kind of a one-way process where things get evolved in the simulator and then applied in the real world, we can test them in the real world and then take the results of that and feed it back into the evolutionary algorithm so that, uh, so that the robots, even the physical robots are really evolving rather than being evolved. So if I just show you this, here we have a, a brand new robot that's just been, just been assembled uh, live in the demo. So thanks very much for watching. I think um, if you have any, any questions or comments in the chat, then I should be able to see them here. That was, uh, that was fantastic, Matt. That's extraordinary. Um, I'll, I'll ask you a quick question. Um, yep. when, when we're talking about the sort of evolutionary nature, how, how long does it take, for example, to, to produce, you know, we're looking for the long term, obviously, but for this sort of process to be, you know, very rapidly producing novel designs um, and, and perhaps coming up with solutions that humans haven't come up with. Yeah, so in terms of um, like fabricating each individual robot, we've just sort of seen it takes a few minutes to put it together, but mm -hmm. the, the 3D printing is really the, the critical point at the moment. So that takes a few hours. So it's sort of two, three, four hours at the moment. So that's an area that we really need to uh, work on because because what we need for, for evolution, the evolutionary algorithms that we have at the moment, they need at least hundreds of, of individuals to be um, to be made to, to kind of really create uh, good functional designs. So partly it's working on those algorithms to get that number down. Partly it's working on the the system so that we can build robots more quickly, as you say. And then, but but also I think inevitably what we need to do is is to have the simulator and the physical robots working together. So a big part of the part of the project is is how do we interface between those two worlds? So so we'll have some robots that are simulated and then some robots that are physical robots. And then it's very important that you could create a new robot that you know we say has a has a virtual mother and a physical father and you could bring those two robots and, and mate them together in inverted commas and, and create a new a new robot. But but then it's it's very um, it's a real challenge to the to the algorithms and it's completely new that that you can do this because we'll inevitably have lots of simulated robots and so we don't want them to outcompete the physical ones and uh, and this so it's yeah it's a very important important area. Fascinating. And I've just got um, we have time for one more question from uh, Rafael Santi here. For, uh, do you constrain the designs or test them prior to building to see if they are at all feasible? Yeah, well, it's interesting that you use the word feasible. So we, we have a couple of different sort of concepts that, that we do. So the first first thing is we do before sending a robot to the to the fabricator, we do check that it's what we call manufacturable. So uh, you can see that the when the robot arm comes in, you could imagine that there might be some designs of robot where the robot arm will, will crash into a previous organ as it tries to put on the next one and this kind of thing. So we, we do check kind of very rigidly to make sure that they're manufacturable and that they're not going to break the system. Um, but then it's, it's sort of a matter of open debate as to whether we should be uh, throwing away robots that we think, oh, this has no chance of being kind of, this being good or being functional um, because, because partly that's, that's a question of, are we going to be, um, are we going to over constrain evolution and just make it do what we think it should do rather than letting it discover new ideas. But then on the other hand, if you, if you don't do that, then we could be wasting a lot of time and effort in things that we know aren't going to work. So, so it's a really good question. And 
it's it's an open question, something that we're really thinking about and think, trying to trying to investigate. Brilliant. Well, thanks, Matt, for that, and um, thanks for being so brave to open our track for the live demo that has worked excellently. So, um, yeah, thanks. Big virtual thanks, round of applause for you. Um, I'm now going to go on to our next talk, which is uh, from Yanis Europolis. Um, he's a stalwart of the, the BRL um, and has been very instrumental in, in sort of worldwide leading um, micro fuel, microbial fuel cell development. Um, and just to keep um, on track, I'm going to keep the, the intro very short and hand directly over to you, Yanis. Uh, <coughs> your slides. Thanks, Mark. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, and uh, good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to, to be here and uh, following on from that live demo from Matt. Uh, hopefully, you, you'll be able to see some of the like the, the, the partnership that was um, um, talked about earlier in terms of the research and how we're, we're thinking about these programs moving forward together. Imagine what Matt was just showing now, but with robots that they have, they have their own biological matter and organs almost with their own microbiome kind of being taken uh, forward. So um, this is the, uh, the the talk that I'll be I'll be giving you today is bioenergy for robotics and and beyond. And, and Mark in his introduction mentioned the microbial fuels, which is the underpinning technology that we have uh, in our um, research uh, portfolio. Uh, <clears throat> starting with. Um, See with uh, where we get um, the inspiration uh, from, um, as, as as Matt described earlier, he spoke a lot about the evolution and how we, we envisage kind of uh, robots coming together. There's a lot to say about adjustment and adaptation in the in the real world, and and these are the things that we are looking in in various biological life forms. Um, I haven't got time to go through all of the examples I've got on, on my slide here, but um, I'd like to just uh, draw your attention on the on the, the main kind of um, example that we're drawing inspiration from the electric eel, which is very capable of producing high levels of voltage uh, and current for short periods of time periods of time in a, in a, in a wet environment where it's the electricity is not supposed to be working very, very well, especially when you're connecting um, little uh, plugs together. Um, there are the examples of mutualism, uh, termites, um, and doing their own agriculture uh, and collecting fungal material, which they then uh, consume for their, their growth and maintenance, and then they continue maintaining the, the fungal uh, kind of uh, colony. Um, there are those examples of, uh, for example, uh, the, the rumen stomach in, uh, in cows, which is an endosomatic kind of um, symbiosis where bacteria help the animal break down the cellulose material that, that the animal cannot in itself digest. And there are some, some wonderful examples of, again, mutualism, uh, not necessarily uh, in the same sense as the, the termites and the, and the fungi, but um, this was a recent example, fairly recent example of, of the Pameridia uh, insect, how it helps the Rorigula shrub uh, consume the, the, the insect prey that it collects, but is unable in itself to consume. So the, the Pameridia insect will, it's the only insect that can actually walk up and down the stem of the shrub without getting stuck. Um, then it goes in and starts stabbing the, the, the caught uh, prey. Um, and once it consumes whatever it can, then it defecates on the, on the stem. So it kind of returns the nutrients uh, to the to the to the shrub that they need for their their growth and maintenance. So uh, with all that and and with kind of trying to look at how robots can behave in a, in a similar way in, in natural environments, especially with minimum human intervention, this is a very simplistic um, diagram that we've put together to describe how this microbial fuel so technology we've been developing can help make the right steps in, in that direction. Uh, it is a fuel cell, so it, it consists of two half cells, a negative anode and a positive uh, cathode. There's a semi-permeable membrane in the middle, and we have electrodes 
in, in both chambers. Um, we work with live bacteria, we collect bacteria from the natural environment, we bring them into the microbial fuel cell, and then we feed them and nurture them um, so that they, in return, uh, give us electricity as a byproduct. These are special microbes known as anodophilic or electroactive uh, bacteria. Uh, <clears throat> once they're inside the microbial fuel cell anode and fuel comes through either us manually feeding it or if the microbial fuel cell is on a robot and the robot collects the food and throws it into the microbial chamber, microbes start consuming and digesting the organic part or sometimes through second order, third order reactions, inorganic elements of the feedstock that has been fed through to them. Um, <clears throat> As we all know from Krebs cycle or tricarboxylic uh, cycle, there is the electron transport chain within that. And in, in, a, in a system where we have soluble mediators, imagine these chemical molecules, they are acting like shuttles. When they are empty, that means when they are oxidized in the absence of an electron, they're able to uh, penetrate the bacterium cell and intercept that electron transport chain, take an electron, and as you can see, that's very much subject to those delta Vs, the different redox potential levels that we have in that system uh, occurring. And once it has the passenger, the, the electrons, then it's able to diffuse outside and, and release the, the electron onto the electrode surface. This is for microbes um, that are incapable of doing that themselves. Um, the diagram also shows those kind of gray oval um, shapes on the electrode surface, those are the anodophilic organisms. They are able to colonize the electrode surface and directly conduct electricity uh, from their own metabolism. And, and I'll show you examples of that in a, in, in a minute. So <clears throat> we basically take that principle and put it into the architectures of microbial furoses we have been designing and uh, developing within the lab. The top right is the stereotypical um, model that, that most labs have in the world, um, which is basically for analytical uh, research. Uh, and we have advanced uh, from that to the one on the bottom right, which is effectively ceramic material acting as the chassis and the, um, the separator, the, the semi-permeable membrane. So here's an example from Moel Najjar's uh, lab. This is, uh, this is quite a, uh, an old image now, but, but uh, quite a, an important one within the scientific community. It is one of the first experiments whereby um, the bacterium Schuanella was captured in this uh, atomic force microscopy image, growing that uh, piece of, it looks to us as a piece of string. That's the nanowire material that the bacterium, as, as you can visibly see, reeled out of its, of its body. And uh, the, the people in, uh, in, in, the, in the group were able to place those gold node electrodes so that they could actually measure the properties of that uh, biological uh, material. And they were able to see, as the, as the title of the slide suggests, that it, it exhibits diode-like effects. They were able to see electrons coming down in one direction once the, the bacterium was able to transfer those electrons or conduct those electrons with the, the electrode surface, which is the, the substratum that the bacterium is, is sitting on. Um, these are some of the images from our own uh, work. These are geobacter biofilms growing on carbon fiber uh, veil, which is the electrode material we have been using in our uh, microbial fuel cells. And, and <clears throat> it's an example of a healthy biofilm uh, growth, um, which effectively means better levels of power production, of electricity production, because all of those microbes are effectively allowing electrons to flow down to the carbon fiber, which we then collect to use for um, the purposes that we, we want to, to use. Um, this is an overview of the work that uh, has happened since the early 2000s, uh, and it's, it's effectively a snapshot of how uh, volume, size, and power have both evolved or developed through the years. And you can see a nice decrease in size. 
and a very healthy increase in power output. And please note a power output is in, is in absolute units. This is not logarithmic. Um, so we put a lot of emphasis on the architecture and the design of our microbial fuel cells. And this is the reason why. Um, we are, as I said, inspired by nature. We are um, studying and, and trying to understand how certain processes happen. And we know from allometric scaling that as we come down in size, there is a, a better kind of um, surface area to volume ratio. And that helps a lot with electrodes and containers when we try to get microbes in that mix to colonize those electrodes and produce electricity that we want to use for different purposes. And that is the example of the microbial fuel cell design that has given us the max, the highest level of power output for its uh, volume. And that's uh, 3.8 milliliters of total volume uh, is that um, uh, vessel there. So how, what do we do with these microbial fuels? So the, the slide here shows you, you know, again, it's an overview of the history over the years. The video playing on the top left is the first example of an autonomous robot that we tried to put together back in 2002, published in 2003, to demonstrate that it can perform a very simple action by simply fed on organic matter. This is equal to one. It is performing phototaxis, as you can see. The dots behind it are not droppings of the robot. Well, not yet, but you'll see some later. Um, those are the markings of where, where the robot stopped in order to recuperate, gather the energy to wake up and continue following the light. Uh, the robot was, was fed with uh, table sugar. We used a lot of chemistry to get that robot uh, kind of going but it nevertheless successfully demonstrated that it can perform phototaxis with minimum human intervention. The video playing on the bottom left is the next generation up, that's ECOBO2. We got rid of all the chemistry. We actually added extra functionality. The uh, robot ECOBO2 uh, is able to perform phototaxis as autonomously as ECOBO1 with, without the, uh, the, the chemistry, but with the ability to sense uh, an environmental parameter and communicate that wirelessly to the to, to the human operator. So the, the robot is, is performing for taxi and doing something useful for us. The video started playing on the top right. That's the next generation, ECOBO3. It's very different architecture, very weird looking wedding cake, kind of. Um, it contains much uh, many more smaller, microbial fuel cells, uh, remember the previous slide that I showed, and the robot is now able to um, move up and down on a railway track. It's not yet able to navigate itself, but it is able to collect food and water from the environment, uh, allow those liquids to be processed on board, so, so maintaining its own circulatory system on board, and then at the end of that cycle, it is able to get rid of um, a pellet of semi-solid material, which is the useless biomass that has accumulated from the digestive process on, on board. It's uh, the first in its in its um, uh, of its of its type that uh, has been able to complete the thermodynamic cycle of fresh food collection, onboard digestion, and waste material excretion. I'll just uh, accelerate the, the next. So um, ECOBOT4 on the bottom right is, is, is the same as ECOBOT3, but with a little bit of more sophisticated AI whereby we can communicate with the robot and as you can see, different architecture as well. And the one in the middle is an ECOBOT on uh, water. Remember the water boatman on that second slide I showed from the biological inspiration examples. This is uh, kind of going from that. It was a collaboration with colleagues from the University of Bristol. And we showed how the power from microbial fuel cells can not only actuate the soft compliant body to open and collect fresh liquid food from the environment, but also allow it to row itself forward um, so I can collect more um, uh, fresh feedstock from that uh, environment. Um, so remember what Matt was showing earlier about the uh, the machine 
kind of producing an organ and then placing it and, and plugging it in. Well, we did something similar. I think it's contemporary with uh, Matt and Professor Alan Winfield's uh, evolutionary work, uh, whereby we took a 3D printer and converted it to a, a liquid handling machine to become a microbial fuel cell production and maintenance machine at the same time. Uh, this is in collaboration with uh, the uh, university shown on the slide um, and it uh, was part of a European project. So uh, we basically put these uh, microbial fuel cells uh, on the uh, machine, on the, on, the, on the 3D printer and uh, <clears throat> established a feedback loop whereby the machine can tell which microbial fuel cell may be underperforming from that collective. And then identify what is the reason why it's underperforming, if it's pH imbalance or starvation, for example, and then go and either collect an alkali or acid solution to neutralize the pH imbalance or fresh food so that it can uh, uh, feed the microbial fuel so that's falling behind and allow us to have a uniform stack which we can then lift and use in a, in a one of our robots or in one of the other examples that we have been developing over, over the years. And the, the longer term vision, which you'll see as part of this kind of presentation, is being able to monolithically produce the microbial fuel cells from the 3D printer, much like what uh, Matt was showing earlier, uh, give them, inoculate them with uh, the microbial community they will need for feeding and digestion, and then let them roam the environment, scavenging for waste material and cleaning the environment from that waste material. Uh, <clears throat> and as we are kind of looking at the microbial fuel cell as a, as a platform technology, of course, we have to be thinking about scaling up. Um, this was a follow-on uh, project, again, funded by the European uh, Commission. We called it Living Architecture. And effectively, it's looking to take microbial fuel cell technology components and integrate them into the fabric of our dwellings, of our households, in inside bricks. So we started the project by taking bricks off the shelf um, uh, as they come and populate them with electrodes and wires, inoculate them with microbes. And we have been able to demonstrate what we could do with single bricks or multiple bricks connected together. The image on the bottom right, it just shows, and what was coming on the video on the, on the top right, just shows the design and futuristic aspect of the project as well, whereby bricks are not necessarily orthogonal or rectangular cuboid, and they could take a different shape depending on, on needs. But of course, the project wasn't just about taking things off the shelf and, and plugging them with uh, existing material. It was asking us, well, actually, we proposed the, the production of a, of a partition wall that would be able to demonstrate that in the household environment. That's a blueprint of what we tried to put together, quite a complicated um, choreography of microbial fuel cells for the bioreactors, synthetic biology, uh, containment um, regimes and strategies, but effectively showing how a household through photosynthesis and biological digestion could be completely off-grid, producing its own uh, detergent uh, material, fertilizer, uh, useful biomass and electricity. And what we did to, to put that as a demonstration is uh, this example here of the partition wall that we put in the Faculty of Applied Sciences. Um, this is a slightly sped up um, video footage showing the wall in action. And you may be able to see that kind of reflecting um, contraption in, on, the, on the top in the middle. That's a motorized window. And the energy to drive that comes from the 15 microbial fuel cells in the middle of that um, wall. Um, so the wall has its own AI uh, and its own kind of uh, control regimes. All that's powered by the microbial fuel cells. And the energy, the excess energy, is used as an exemplar to show how uh, households of the future, uh, in terms of ventilation, they could be powering, for example, the lighting, the mains, uh, sockets, and the motorized windows to be opening and closing for uh, thermostatic conditions. And further scaling up, taking the technology 
uh, completely out of the, of the lab and putting it in the context of social use. This is the work funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We called it uh, Urinitricity or, or P-Power. Um, and the photo here is uh, the example of the most recent uh, Glastonbury uh, music festival that has happened with the, uh, the P-Power installation. We have been going to Glastonbury with a P-Power installation since 2015, um, consecutively and um, it's it's an example of how we think microwave fuel cells can scale up um, and being broken down into smaller manageable kind of subunits but working together as whole units to produce electricity um, for direct lighting but also for controlled lighting. And what I mean by that is we are pushing the envelope of the microwave fuel cell technology to be directly plugging in to charging uh, mobile phone devices, other electronic gadgets, lighting, uh, motors, pumps, and so on and so forth, but also through energy harvesting so that we can accumulate the energy for higher power uh, rating or operations. And this was the example we did that. This was done with self-stratified membrane-less uh, microwave fuel cells, simply in terms of putting them together. Uh, and we were able to show that the, the lighting, as you can see, uh, could be directly coming from the microwave fuel cells, but could also be controlled through energy harvesting. Uh, to put it in context, the Gates Foundation, they're, they're not necessarily interested in the, in the music festival and, and how Panthers can benefit from that. Of course, it is an important aspect of our society, and it is an example where um, <clears throat> temporary sanitation needs to go in and then come out in the space of five or six days. But there are those other more serious examples in the global south, for example, where there is a, a poverty that's preventing even um, the very basics in, in human life and education to be taking place. So this is one example in uh, Kisoro, Uganda, uh, where we have uh, basically taken a microbial fuel or, or a P-power system. This is the stack inside the hut. We purposefully built downhill from the toilet block of a secondary boarding uh, girls' school in, in Kisoro. We changed the interface so we could be collecting the liquid from the toilets. And effectively, we uh, furnished the toilet block with lighting inside the, the cubicles and outside to illuminate the path and the power to do that was coming from the microwave fuel cells. It was wonderful and at the same time astonishing to hear that the girls, the pupils, were actually congregating outside the, the toilet uh, to study because that was where they had the, the stable light source compared to the very intermittent uh, lighting that they have at the, at the dorms. Uh, <clears throat> but coming back to, to the lab, and, and science, we are dealing with biological material and the current pandemic is a stark example of how things could go uh, wrong. Uh, we have to responsibly allow this technology to go out into the real world. And therefore, if there was even a, a remote chance of the microbial community being taken over by pathogenic organisms, then the, the microbial fuel cell technology would be a propagator of an outbreak. So uh, back in the lab, we have tested different bacterial and uh, viral um, uh, species to see whether the microbial fuel cell technology is capable of stopping that from, from happening. And you may be, not be able to see uh, much from these um, graphs here, but effectively what we're showing is a cascade of microbial fuel cells can sequentially not only suppress, but actually kill the alien organisms, those would be the pathogenic organisms, coming in and competing for the same uh, energy source. And the same we did for Hep B uh, virus. We were at least able to show that we can attack the surface antigen and break the core antigen. It wasn't a complete consumption of Hep B virus, but this is work that we are currently looking at with other viruses as well. And the robotics context is always there. This is our background and our passion. Um, there's now um, a lot more recent work which is looking at making all those kind of uh, essential functions or organs of a, of a, a biological agent or an artificial agent uh, working 
with, with microbes. So thermal sensing, tactile sensing, taste orientation, sound, even light de detection, um, and in, in some cases, even gas, presence of gas detection can be done with intelligent uh, forms of microbes coming into machines uh, and integrated to work as a, as a robot. Um, <clears throat> this is all based on the biofilm. Um, the, the, the talk has hopefully shown you how the uh, a simple, a fairly simple plat yet platform technology, which is the microbial fuels, is because of the biofilm um, and the intelligence of the microbes. We can look at processing different types of waste or other material for immediate um, outputs, treated wastewater, power, catholite, which I, I haven't even touched upon uh, as, a, as a bactericidal and liquid fertilizer, and of course the pathogen killing. And then from that, we can expand to all those other applications that we're th uh, showing there. Um, we couldn't have put it better. Dilbert ca cartoon did a lot better for us uh, in 2014. The vision from a, a robotics research is what's uh, shown there. Uh, robots that can actually feed on waste material and then produce fertilizer as service to, to humanity. And with that, I'd like to uh, acknowledge all of my uh, colleagues and collaborators within the center and those that have come uh, and finished and are now uh, in, in uh, better places working. And of course, our sponsors, funders and uh, collaborators for the, uh, the, the partnership work over the years and you for your attention. Thank you. Well, thank you, Yanis, as usual. Um, fascinating <laughs> stuff. I've got about a million questions that I could ask, but there's a few that's come in, which we'll just go through quickly because we're supposed to be um, on break now uh, to give everyone a bit of a comfort break. Um, but obviously we start a little late. So the first question comes from GM. Um, Yanis, this diode effect, how reliable is it? Uh, I presume that the current flow depends on the size of the bacteria. Um, that's a very good question. The current flow actually depends on the metabolic rate of the bacteria, not necessarily the size. Um, although nanowires have been um, recorded, at least in scientific research, from rod shape materials rather than uh, spore uh, materials, uh, by, by, by microbes, uh, my apologies. So the, the rate of electron transfer, transfer is subject to metabolic uh, rate, which is also tied to the growth rate. Um, so it is species dependent. And there are, as we know from um, microbiology, slower growing bacteria and much faster growing bacteria. I think the fastest is uh, eight minutes kind of turnover or uh, kind of next generation um, uh, production. Um, and that is what will uh, define the rate of electron transfer because it is a byproduct of, of metabolism. It also depends on the substratum. So if it's a, not a very good electron sink, the electrode surface, then of course microbes will not be able to uh, allow as much charge transfer to, to take place. So those are the governing factors for electron transfer. Brilliant. Well, I hope that answers the question. The, the next one comes from, uh, this is me today. Uh, sir, how do microbial fuel cells play an important role in this case? And this, this was asked during the living bricks part of your presentation. Um, so the, um, the the living bricks or the living architecture is, uh, as as mentioned, an example where we we, we see the scaling up of uh, microbial fuel cell technology uh, directly into our households. So imagine in the in the not so distant future with planning permission and all the the, the regulatory framework uh, being uh, adhered to uh, households and the and the bricks that make the households to be uh, populated with microbial fuel cell technology so that the microbes can then take their place in those key uh, positions within the microbial fuel cells so, and the liquid how um uh, wastewater coming from a household would then be processed as it does. It comes down the, the pipes and then goes into the sewerage for uh, some of uh, um, our 
uh, households or into the septic tank, it may as well go through the, the bricks with proper insulation and hydraulic engineering um, so that we can treat the wastewater and then render it as useful fertilizer and at the same time recover the energy that we could be using for uh, our day-to-day -day use. Brilliant. I think that answers the question and leads very nicely into, um, I think, the, the last question we've got time for from Lestes. Could this technology be powered by something very impure like uh, food or garden waste? Uh, again, a very good question and, and the, the short answer is yes. In fact, we, we experimented with a range of organic material coming from our natural environment. We've also experimented with uh, food scraps, kitchen scraps. The work on living architecture allowed us to experiment with real household wastewater, including wastewater coming from the bathtub, hand wash basin, uh, toilet, uh, of course, um, the, the kitchen, um, a washing machine, dishwasher, uh, and so on and so forth. Some of the organic material we experimented with in the lab um, we've uh, we've looked at grass clippings, prawn shells, rotten biomass, rotten fruit, and even dead insects. Awesome. Well, thanks, Yanis, again. That was a fascinating um, talk that shows the massive amount of um, sort of history that you've created uh, and innovation and bringing together loads of cross-disciplinary cutting-edge research. Um, and thanks to Matt for the, the first talk. Um, that concludes the, the first session. Um, I'll just quickly post the link to the, the next session, which will be starting at 11 a.m. So um, thanks very much for attending and see you all in about 10 minutes. Thanks, Mark. <laughs>